welcome to today's devotion. We are in the Gospel of Luke. And last time we were together, we took a look at chapter 5, verses 33 through 35. And it focused on fasting. Today we're going to take a look at verse 36 through 39. Which is, you know, the next verses and that will conclude the chapter. So, let's pray and we'll get into it. Lord, thank you for your kindness Thank you for your faithfulness. You are faithful when we are not. And as we go through trial after trial and tribulation after tribulation, you prove yourself faithful and increase our trust in you, our confidence in you, our assurance in you, and in return, we experience your peace. So as we go into your word again today, Father, please open up our hearts to understand even more clearly the truth of your word and the freedom that it brings. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a look at verse 36, chapter 5 again of Luke, where it says this. Um, I know we're, we're uh, videotaping, but there's somebody at the door, so I'm going to ask Corey to go open the door, please, but we're going to continue our, our study. So verse 36 says this, Jesus also told them a parable, and here's the parable. It's one verse. No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but the piece from the new garment will not match the old. That's the first verse, or verse 36, the first verse of this parable, and that's the first parable. Now here's another parable in the following verse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, it will spill, and the skins will be ruined. No, no. New wine is put into fresh wineskins. Now the last parable, verse 39. And no one, after drinking old wine, wants new because he says the old is better. Three different teachings all rolled into one. The heading on my Bible, or uh, the, I don't have a heading on this one, but the verse actually in verse 36 says he told them a parable. Now, Let's get into this because these three examples, these three illustrations, parables tie into the teaching that he gave regarding fasting. And if you understand it, then it, it, become, it starts to become all intertwined. It's, it's all one teaching on one subject matter. And that is spiritual, character-wise transformation. The best example that I can think of off the top of my head that comes from one of Paul's letters is, is, is a segment that he writes to the Roman church where he says, therefore we rejoice or let us rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us. But there's that first line, let us rejoice. In our, rejoicing in our sufferings is antithetical to how we live our lives. We avoid suffering at all cost, and, we, and whenever we experience it, we certainly do not rejoice in it. So how, what, how do you even get there? How does, he, how does a person get to being able to write that? And this is what all of the parables that we just read, even though they might be one verse long, relate to. Let's look at the first one. He told of a parable, no one t tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. Now, he's using an example in real life, but it's a great physical example of a spiritual truth. Meaning, whatever, is going, whatever God is doing within us that is a new work, it is a new work that embodies and involves and includes our entire being. It's not just the heart. 
it's not just the mind, and it's not just the body, it's all three. As the prophet Jeremiah says in, in predicting what God is going to do, I'm going to put my law in their hearts. I'm giving them, I'm making, I'm doing something new. And so I will put my law in their hearts. It's a transformation of the heart. And I will give them a new mind. This is part of repentance. But changing the heart and changing the mind can only be effective if it's in line with the change of the body. Because you may think differently, you may realize that God is with you. For example, as Jesus says, um, for a great example that I, I think we used last devotion was, in this world you will have tribulation, but fear not or take care or take courage. Whatever case may be, I've overcome the world. Now that truth that he says, you may, first of all, read it for the first time or maybe the second time, third time, fourth time, however many times, that begins to affect the mind. But the heart struggles with it. Yeah, do I have confidence in it? Do I really have confidence in it? And that also is within the, the confines of the body. Does my body believe that he's overcome the world? If he who is within me, the spirit of Christ, the very being of Christ is in me and has overcome the world, why is it that my body does not feel at peace with that? given the, tr the, the, the situation in my life that's fearful. And that's just one example. Jesus talks about do not worry. God knows everything, and, and um, in, in God knowing everything, he knows every hair on your head. Or in my case, not so much. In Corey's case, every hair on his back. The point being is that God knows us and our bodies more intimately than we know our bodies. It, it's not just hyperbole. God knows our bodies better than we know our bodies. So he knows the effect that fear, that sin, that anxiety, that danger has upon us. He knows how it makes us feel. He knows how it makes us sick. And so it's a physical thing. When Jesus says no one tears a patch from a new garment, puts it on the old, he's making it clear. It is a physical transformation. The new belongs to the new. The, new, the news, the good news of Jesus Christ cannot reside in a body that's been conditioned to react habitually and repeatedly from fear. It must be redone. The best example I can think of currently is Peter himself. When reacting out of overwhelming fear, denies Jesus three times, twice to a young girl, realizes that the belief system of his body is not in alignment with the belief that he has in his head. He believes Jesus is the Christ. He believes that he can trust Jesus. For goodness sake, he saw Jesus walk on water. He saw Jesus perform countless miracles. He knows the power of Jesus, but his body doesn't believe it. So when confronted with the very real possibility of torture and death, his body reacts the way that every other person would behave in a conditioned body of this world, we feel we have to take matters into our own hands and we spring into fear, reaction, behavior. And God wants to break us of that. The next verse, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. It's the same thing, it's physical. You don't put the new wine, which is the gospel, into an old body. The body, too, has to be transformed. And this is a process. This is not a process that it will be done overnight. 
It's not a process that you're going to be able to gauge. It's not like a diet. It's not like some kind of physical exercise. You don't get a Fitbit and go, oh, I walked so many steps today. You can't measure it. You'll know it when God reveals it to you, going from situation to situation to situation and realize, you know what, I'm just not afraid in that situation anymore. I don't know how it happened, but previously, I would have been afraid. I would have been terrified, but I'm not now. How did that happen? Well, God is working through us, not just in our mind, not just in our heart, but in our body. Lastly, and no one after drinking old wine wants new because he says the old is better. And I love that one because that one, I thought we were talking about new, 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 new. No, the old wine, (laughs) the old wine is the original, the original God, the original nature, the original spirit of God. That's what we want. We don't want something new because God is it doesn't change. We want the God of Abraham, the God of Adam, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of Jesus, the original, the old wine. That's what we want. And so all three of these teachings relate to spiritual transformation. Started with the fasting in verse 33. And so... I invite us to be aware, and and Jesus teaches all of his disciples this process. No one is excluded. We all go through our own failures, like, like, like Peter did. We all go through our own learning curve, but it's all, it is all dealing with the habitual way that our body reacts to the domination of the fear in this world. Because this is how the devil runs it, through fear. Not just fear, <clears throat> but primarily fear. Because sin being the rebellious state, once you're in sin, once you're in rebellion, you begin to act out in a rebellious way, which is to manipulate, to dominate, and to intimidate, which are all manipulations based on fear. The evil Satan devil will always use from his rebellion and the rebellion that he's placed within our nature methods of intimidation, manipulation, and domination. And they all are designed to be effective in fear, through fear, with fear, means of fear. Well, this then brings us to the end of this chapter, and then we're going to get into uh, chapter 6. I pray and um, ask God that as we're growing together, we can grow in our ability to, in Psalm 46, be still, and know, not just know mentally, but physically to know that he is God. To be still in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our physical body, and in that stillness, be in his presence and know Not just know here, but literally know physically as well that he is God. And he cares for us and will not leave us. And there's absolutely nothing we need to fear. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you next time. God bless you.